appreciate that. Uh, my name is Mike Sable. I work for the city of Maplewood. I do uh, assistant city manager, HR director. And my role today is to make sure that you have good information, that you have good dialogue, that we have a fair and open process. And so I will be the a timekeeper and the mover along of discussion. Uh, and the good news is, is you are all here because you're uh, smarter than I am and can have good insight into what we have to do next. So uh, I have the easy job, uh, but I appreciate everybody taking time out of your schedules to get settled in and, and help us with this important work. Uh, I will do, we're not gonna do as broad an introduction as we did last time, but I will call on you partially because I wanna hear your voice and partially I wanna test your audio. Uh, so I will uh, do like I did before. I'll call out a name and then I'll forecast two people in advance about whose turn it is next. And by the luck of the draw, Neil Brenneman is in the corner. So Neil will go first, Audra will go second, and Dorothy will go third. So Neil, Audra, and Dorothy, please. Neil, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, Neil Brenneman uh, again uh, with uh, Maplewood Parks and Recreation. And uh, Glad to have everybody back that uh, was able to make it today. Good, thank you, and you sound good. Audra, you're next, uh, followed by Dorothy, then Nolan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this event today. Uh, I'm Audra Robbins, Parks and Recreation Manager with the City of Maplewood. Okay, Audra, you, would you do me a favor, lean in a little bit closer yep. to that microphone and be louder, please. Okay. Say all of that again. All right. Audra Robbins with Maplewood Parks and Recreation. I'm the Parks and Recreation Manager. That better? That was much better. Thank you. Okay. You got to be somehow closer. Yeah, I'll keep leaning into this laptop. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Dorothy, then Nolan, then Mike Erickson, please. Hi, Dorothy Molstead, um, Park and Rec Commission um, Chair. That's it for tonight. Good. You sound good. Thank you, Dorothy. Nolan, then Mike Erickson, then Beth, please. Uh, Nolan Cornell uh, with the South St. Paul Youth Boys Basketball Association. Wonderful. Mike Sounds Erickson. Good. Oh, oh. oh, Mike, then Beth, then Bill, please. There we go. Mike Erickson representing uh, the Maplewood Historical Society, and uh, I happen to be the current president. We're out of the uh, Brewer Truck Farm on County Road D. Thank you, Mike. Beth, then Bill, then Bryce, please. Hi, this is Beth Watrude. I'm from the Northeast United Soccer Club out of Maplewood, 622. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Bill, then Bryce, then Bow, please. Good evening, uh, Bill Knudsen, Maplewood City Council. I'm happy to be here. Good, you sound good. Thank you, Bryce, and then Bow, please. <laughs> Hello again, uh, Bryce Sheeran, City of Little Canada, Parks and Rec Director. Bryce, thank you very much. And you got a coworker, it looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I got a helper tonight. Good, good, Hello. good. Excellent. Uh, Bao and then Aaron, please. Hi, this is Bao. Good to meet everyone tonight. Nice to hear you. You sound good. Thank you. Aaron, bring us home, please. Introduce yourself and. Hey, I'm Aaron, uh, Maplewood resident. Great to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Good, thank you. Everybody sounds good. Everybody looks great. Um, I will do my best to uh, monitor along the screen. So if you wave your hand or if you raise it, do something like this, I'll try to catch it. Uh, you can certainly feel free to use the chat box. I'll try to read those as those things come in. Um, if you're uh, very Zoom savvy, you can raise your hand within the uh, mechanism and I'll try to catch those too. Um, just for um, kind of a housekeeping item, we do have the website uh, where we have all of the information posted. So any, everything that you've been delivered. We've got available on our website. We even have replays of the last meeting. Um, we'll have our, the presentation materials that are out there get shared. So if there's some sort of thought that you have and you want to come back and research something, you can come back and it's available on our website at maplewoodmn.gov. Um, again, so this is uh, the Recreation and Parks Task Force for Programming. Um, this was created by the City Council um, uh, in an attempt to get input from key stakeholders on what we do next in a, uh, in a plan for a post-COVID environment. And we did a lot of table setting last time around budget and around impacts and had some pretty good dialogue around some questions around how does it all work. And one of the things that the group wanted 
from our last meeting is kind of a deeper understanding and how stuff works. And so Audra and Neil being um, great staff members have actually done just that. And so um, we're gonna do a little bit of uh, sharing of some information, a little bit deeper dive on programming and revenues and expenses and kind of really get into some of the nuts and bolts about it. And what I would ask you to do is to, you know, if you can follow along, um, <laughs> listen politely. And then when you have a question or something emerges, uh, ask them right away. It's, it's sometimes easier for us to do this in real time. Uh, it, you know, so if there's a question that you have, I will try to monitor as best I can. Um, Audra and Neil, I'll look to you for a setup that you want from me, and then I'll, be, I'll work for you for the next little bit. So you tell me what you need, and we'll go from there. Sure, sounds good. Um, attached to, with your agenda, so the materials that you got ahead of time were uh, a summary of the Park Systems Master Plan, and I think we'll start with that and just give a little background on that process and um, what the plan is. It'll kind of set the stage for the conversation tonight. And then I also, we also included the 2019 annual report that we do every year with the Parks and Recreation Commission of which Dorothy is our chair extraordinaire. And so um, we'll go over that and, and it's kind of a nice little recap of what happened during the year as well. So we'll just briefly touch on that and then kind of dive into, as Mike said, the nuts and bolts of some of the information that you ask us to take a deeper dive on. And um, I'll be looking to Neil to help share some of that as well. And you didn't get that ahead of time, but we do have a presentation for, on that for you as well of the variety of programs we have, some you know big picture budget items for certain programs we kind of pulled out and focused on, and then some of the things we've done for marketing. So that is, I think, kind of the plan for tonight, if that works for you all. Good. Uh, any questions right now for Audra? All right, I'm gonna mute, but I'm gonna keep monitoring. And if you want, do you want me to share the screen for the, mar for the master plan or how do you want yeah, me to? Yeah, for the executive summary, that would be great. Thank you. I will find my, hold on just a second. Okay. And we'll kind of go through this quickly. Um, oh, there we go. All right. Um, one reason I, we decided to share the executive summary with you and not the entire plan is that the Park Systems Master Plan itself is over 90 pages long and it's very in-depth and I would be happy to give a link or provide that information to anyone who would like to see the whole plan, but we just thought it'd be good to focus on the, exec, <laughs> the executive summary for now and I'll give you just a brief background on this process and and Mike Erickson, remind me, were you were you part of the task force on the Park Systems Master Plan? I, I was not, but okay. I was aware of, of it. And it, sure. and it dates back to, to when, Audra? We started the process in 2013, actually, yeah. starting okay. to do all the engagement and the research and, and come up with a statistically valid survey. Um, and we wrapped up and it was, it was approved by the council in 2015, the beginning of 2015. So it was really a two-year process to put this together. Yep. I was work I was working with you at the time, but I was yep. not on the gotcha. I was not on the uh, yep. 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 Okay. And um one thing I'll touch on just in the introduction is that, you know, our system in Maplewood um is known for its leadership and sustainability, uh and diverse recreation options. We have fifty parks and preserves at, that serve as neighborhood anchors and provide places for community gathering, athletics, and with along with the community center and the nature center up until now we're also having the task force as mike has mentioned to kind of figure out the direction for the nature center going forward but um our park system has been tr has been transitioning over the years from a developing system into a mature system and that created some real challenges for us um, at the core of future issues was the need for extensive park revitalization and reinvestment um, system-wide replacement of aging park facilities like playgrounds, courts, fields, shelters, and signage. And in addition, um, significant reinvestment in the community center was needed. The nature center was going to need investment. And um, what came out of the, the plan was the number one concern of residents that we heard overall through this entire process was taking care of our existing system was the number one community identified priority for the future. So, um, and as far as recreation, 
With the plan, um, updating recreation offerings so that the system remained fresh, exciting, and relevant in light of changing demographics and recreation trends was really important. And as many of you know, or everyone knows, you know, Maplewood's uh, demographics have really changed over the last 10 years. And so the challenge is making sure that we're providing programming that's relevant and important to the citizens of Maplewood in the area. So I will go to the, you can stay on that slide, Mike, the one you're at, yep. And this was just kind of a breakdown of, of the purpose of the plan. And again, as I said, it's to guide reinvestment in and revitalization of the parks and recreation system for the next generation of Maplewood residents. And this again was looked at as at least a 20 year plan of what we were gonna do going forward. Um, and there are five different areas um, of the plan and they're divided into parks and recreation facilities, trails, natural areas and greenways programs and arts and culture. Um, and then when we came up with the vision for parks and recreation, you can see that on the screen there, it is to help create a vibrant community that embraces diversity, celebrates arts and culture, values health and wellness, and promotes stewardship of the environment. And with that, the guiding principles that we used throughout the plan were um, the focus on having safe and welcoming parks, connecting people and places, encouraging health and wellness, promoting environmental stewardship, inspiring creativity and learning, and financial sustainability. So, Mike, Mike, if you go to the next slide. And I'm just gonna kind of gloss over the, uh, the community in involvement and the input in the process, but I will tell you that um, we came, it was the community input and the engagement took place over 2013 and 2014 and included, uh, we had a parks and recreation task force made up of community members kind of like these meet, this meeting is, um, and elected officials who met 16 times. We had 16 meetings over the course of putting the plan together. We did a statistically valid citywide parks need assessment survey. Uh, we had online input and serve, um, places where people could give feedback. We had 11 community open houses. Um, we actually broke out into focus groups at um, the high schools and the middle schools, I believe even the middle schools, but we did outreach to, to young people to see what they were interested in doing. And we also had other focus groups like um, we had an arts and culture one that I headed up that um, included members of the community. It was Ashland Theater members, and it was just trying to get a, I think people from the Historical Society were involved in that as well, Mike, if I, don't, if I remember correctly, and just trying to get what the arts and culture needs for Maplewood were. Um, we had business community outreach and then um, input from the Parks and Rec Commission. We went before them several times and got their feedback as we went along. So it was a pretty involved process. Um, and we had a lot of great feedback and out of that, um, some key findings, I'll just touch on those really quickly. 70% uh, of households have visited parks and preserves in the last 12 months. And again, this was in 2013, 2014, but 70%, that's a, that's a good number. Uh, walking, hiking, and biking trails were the most used amenities at 86%. After trails, neighborhood parks were the most needed. That was their, the opinion of the people that were surveyed and, and we got feedback from, it was 61%. Um, residents have unmet needs for a whole variety of parks, facilities, and activities. Developing a new large destination park with citywide amenities was the most major addition to the system. And that kind of, out of that came uh, Wakefield, community building and the Wakefield Park improvements. That was something that came out of um, what we found in this, in this research. And priority for funding should be for improvements to existing parks, preserves, and trails. And 34% of respondents would vote in favor of a tax to fund the types of projects most important to their household over the next 10 years. And the chart's pretty small on the bottom. I don't know if you guys can zoom in and see, but I was just gonna touch on a few of the top responses of the improvements that people most desired near their homes. And first were restrooms in the park. It may seem like a small thing, but having restrooms was very important to residents, which is one reason we put a uh, unisex bathroom on the Wakefield community building that can be accessed from the outside, even when the building isn't open. And our plan was to try to put uh, restroom facilities in the parks going forward. Uh, security, there was safety was a big issue that we heard, so they wanted more lighting, um, picnic tables and benches, uh, drinking fountains, shade structures, picnic shelters, natural areas, trails, and then parking. Those were the main issues that people identified that they would love to have in the parks around where they were at. 
Any questions on this at all? I don't want to go too fast. Looking around, does anybody have any questions where we're? Okay. We'll Mike Erickson, it looks like he's trying to unmute. So I'm going to give him a second. Okay, sure. and the, go ahead, Mike. No, I, I just uh, a comment, not even a question. Um, I think the the uh, executive summary is very important for us to to understand. So I'm glad you're going through it and, and selecting what we need to hear, Audra. And certainly the Wakefield Park is a very significant improvement in uh, in Maplewood and Maplewood Parks. So that was it. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Anyone, Anyone else? Oh. All right. Audra, go ahead. Sure, you can go on to the next slide. And this gets more into, won't touch on this too much because this task force is focusing on programming, but they do tend to go hand in hand in some cases. Uh, and for parks and recreation facilities, again, what we heard was taking care of our existing system was the highest community priority, um, reinvesting in and upgrading parks and facilities. And uh, one thing that also came out of that was being dedicated, trying each year to, either replace or improve one playground or tennis court, uh, or like I said, uh, working on the Wakefield Park improvements. We had things in the CIP to improve Goodrich Park. Um, we just were working on the Harvest Park master plan this past year before COVID hit, um, and just trying to reimagine that park and what services it could offer. Um, and Hazelwood, which is a, you know, one of our community athletic parks, and we host big events like the 4th of July there. So. That all came out of the master plan, what we heard residents wanted. And so we started making plans going forward to see how we could get that done. Um, and so again, restrooms, drinking fountains, shelters, these are all important things and to the residents of Maplewood. And then updating the recreation facility mix to reflect the community interest was of utmost importance. So they, they let us know that community gardens were important. We helped work with uh, St. Paul and Ramsey County on a two-loop court, um, adding pickleball to our parks. That's one thing that happened in the Harvest Park plan was taking the tennis court that was there. And the idea is to, in the future, potentially repurpose that to pickleball courts because we don't have any dedicated pickleball courts in Maplewood currently. Um, looking at adding disc golf courses, um, those are just examples. And now that we know where outside time is even more important in those um, Athletic activities that people can do by themselves, like disc golf and things are even more important. So we'll be looking at that in the future for sure. Um, and just the reinvestment, making sure that people are really happy that of all the parks and open spaces we have and they want to maintain them to keep them for the future. So I don't know if you can see on the map, again, it's, it's fairly small, but it just talks about um, some ideas for signature parks. This has already changed since uh, 2015, but it still gave ideas of, of what could be done. And like I said, the first one to come out of it were the Wakefield Park improvements. Um, the next slide, Mike, is just focuses on the trail important. We, we tried to identify where there were trail connections missing because um, we it's so important. People thought trails and connectivity were super important to their enjoyment and use of our park system. Um, and so the key will show you what were projects between 2013 and 2016 were the dark blue got, dotted line. Uh, planned CIP projects, there wasn't a timeline, but the ones in purple were uh, trail connections and things we were planning to do. Um, the yellow were priority project corridors. Uh, the thin orange line were existing pedestrian bicycle networks, and then just calling out the city preserves, parks, and regional parks. So. A lot of thought went into how we can improve connections so people can enjoy the system. On to the next slide, please. And this just talks more about trails and our natural spaces that they were super important to the, the residents of Maplewood. And not only our trails, but our natural areas and our greenways are very important um, because Maplewood puts a, a priority and a focus on on environmental issues and this all ties into that. So if you want to, if you have something you want to ask me about this, I'm happy to ask it, but I may just move on because of the focus of this group. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, I'll just, I'll fill in some time so you can take a breath because I know that's a lot of talking simultaneously. So you can have okay. a sip of water and catch your breath a little bit. Um, I know the maps are really hard to see and then so, but it's, I think it's important to kind of get a sense for 
the city really does try to think of these things holistically. Um, I do want to point out one of the challenges that the Nature Center Task Force identified is that a lot of these things are uh, regional amenities. And so sometimes the, the boundary, the physical boundary of a city is blurred if you have a car and you want to drive to somewhere else, or if you want to go to Dodge Nature Center, if you want to go to the West Metro and do some things at Three Rivers Parks. And so uh, while the maps and the services here are focused really on Maplewood, this group understands kind of the regional draw of uh, services. And so Otter's got a chance to catch your breath and get some water and I'll turn it back to you now. Sure. And again, if any questions about the community and neighborhood preserves map or anything here, otherwise we will move on to the programming portion of the summary. And again, with our guiding principles, we had a focus on several different things and one of them was arts and culture. That picture in the master plan there is actually one of our dance classes that was, that's over at the community center on the stage. Um, the arts enhance livability, bring diverse groups of people together, celebrate history and heritage and contribute to economic vitality um, and enhance learning. So it, it's super important to the community and we've always tried to find a balance of sports, um, self-guided recreation, but also trying to focus on arts and culture as well to bring a, a whole group of diverse programming to the residents of Maplewood. Um, and we definitely had room to grow, so we're always looking for ways to, to increase that and, and partner. And Mike, I don't know if you want to talk about even some of the programming at the, sorry to put you on the spot, I care right. just about some of the things you do at the Burn Trip Farm with arts and culture. Yep. We're, uh, we're certainly doing a, a, a number of things, but I think uh, um, the uh, partnership that we have with the Maplewood Parks and Rec uh, Department is very significant in terms of, uh, you know, no, nothing, we, we weren't able to do any activities this year, but uh, uh, we do movie night with uh, Parks and Rec. We do uh, the, the Boo Bash, big Halloween get together. And then um, we do uh, music. We do music in the barn. And I think all of that, and then us continuing to focus on arts uh, and culture. Uh, we now have had uh, plays. We had uh, Sisters of Swing last year in the barn, uh, um, a play, a singing play. And uh, I think those are the sorts of things that we want to continue to do and, and offer to our residents uh, something different than just pure recreation. Thanks, Mike. Yep. And then just to kind of summarize again with programming, I'm just gonna recap because the ex executive summary says it better than I could. Uh, recreation is an essential component of a healthy, vital community. Recreation programs are pursued for enjoyment, health, skill development, enrichment, socialization, entertainment, physical fitness, and relaxation. Dynamic recreation and demographic trends mean programs need to constantly evolve, which is a challenge, but it's also an exciting, exciting prospect. Um, and so we, Constantly, we're trying to change what we offered, how we offered, and now we have this additional challenge of, of budgetary concerns and COVID-19 COVID issues of how do you provide programming to people and safely. And so all of that makes this challenge a little more difficult, um, which is one reason we have this task force to help try to figure out what to do going forward. All right, and if, Mike, if you could go to the next slide. And this was kind of an interesting part of the summary. Um, it's just about implementation of all the information we found out and the plan. And there's a little chart up in the right-hand corner. And the question was asked if an additional $100 was available for city parks, preserves, trails, recreation facilities, how would the households allocate the funds? So they got to divide up. If they had $100 to put places, where would they put it? Um, $31 of that 100 were they said to put improve existing neighborhood and community parks. Uh, they had improve existing preserves, $11. Develop new preserves, trails, and recreation areas, $10. Um, acquisition of open space adjacent to the Ma Maplewood Nature Center, that was a, a thought at one time was $8. Development of new facilities, 15, and other eight. So just kind of an interesting response from the community there. Um, and I'm just going to touch on the benefits of having the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. It was to be used as a roadmap for system revitalization, a defensible rationale for decision-making, 
strategic resource allocation, budgeting and staffing, foster strong partnerships, helps with safe and welcoming parks and updated recreation facility mix, a more connected city, continued access to nature, more relevant programs, integration of the arts into the park system and long-term economic sustainability. And there's, there's the big one right now that we're focusing on. Uh, so that is just kind of a summary of the plan. And like I said, I'd be more than happy to connect any of you with the full plan if, if you're interested and any questions on this. Yeah, the full the full plan is 112 pages, so you can it's it's in depth reading. If you are uh, bored one day, you can certainly just take a look at it, and it's like a novel. It'll read it'll read quickly though. Uh, questions or reactions about this um, kind of grounding information for Audra or for Neil? Um, I'll just kind of leave it open for folks to jump in. Dorothy, go ahead, and then Beth, and then Mike. Hi. Okay, I just would like to say that the the long term planning that went into that plan certainly has been part of what the Recreation Commission um, has used and looked at as we make our recommendations and goals each year. Um, it, it's really been a wonderful document uh, to assist us in our work. Good. Thank you, Beth, and then Mike Erickson, and then I'll keep looking for others to comment. What was the blue area in the final pie chart you showed? You know what, I could, I could delve into the whole report. I, these were just ones they highlighted in the summary, but if you want the full breakdown of it, I can get that information for you. It's not, okay. it's not listed in the, the chart. Yeah, I couldn't, I didn't see anything. Yep. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't name all of them. They called out some of them. So I could, I'm sure it's in the document for sure. And I can get that for you. Okay. I'll keep looking while you're talking as well. Uh, Mike Erickson, question or comment? Yeah, Mike, say, uh, question. Did, did I miss it? Was there, did I miss the financing portion of it? Did you, did you put, uh, identify f uh, financing r uh, sources? Was that in there or not in there? In the, in the plan? Right. I mean, I would assume. We, yep, we looked at ways, different ways of how we could finance things. Yep, we did. Um, Funding recommendations are, they, they, were, they were big picture, but um, yep. they were, one was to develop an asset management plan just to yep. see what we have and where we're going. And we have been working on that with the Cartograph software that we've implemented as a city. So that was our, the management plan because before that we did not have one evaluating ongoing operational and life cycle costs when making you know capital decisions um then we talked about increasing parks and recreation share of current levy exploring the use of a uh, franchise free uh, franchise, franchise fee yep say that 10 times to fund maintenance or specific programs updating parks trails and open space dedication requirements on an annual basis that would be pack funds availability charges, uh, seeking grants, exploring funding options dedicated to health improvement. And we did do that with the, the outdoor fitness equipment that's around the pond. Yep. The yep. Yep. We partner with Health East and some of the other groups. So that, that's what that refers to. Increasing fees. So, I mean, that's a simple thing, yep. but it's, they may have to increase fees. Um, establishing an infrastructure replacement reserve fund was looked at. Creating a fees and changes policy that identifies services that meet the needs of the basic community and are 100% tax supported. Um, and it goes on a little more from there. Encourage business involvement, sponsorships, naming rights, recreation facilities and events. And then of course the big one, consider a bond referendum. Nope. You, know, you that's did. Awesome. That's, a, that's excellent, Audra. And I think that's important for everybody to hear. You, you guys didn't miss anything. You, you hit them all. Good, thank you. And Beth? Uh, to answer your question, the blue one was to um, connect existing trails and purchase additional trails right of ways. Thank you. Thank yep, you. I just found the slide. Uh, here it was in slightly larger format. So you can get a sense for say, uh, connect existing trails and purchase additional trail rights of way. So um, okay. really focused around access and acquisition. 
So there we go. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, other questions or reactions to uh, Audra's um, review of the executive summary? Like I said, it's 112 pages. There's a lot to digest and kind of pour over. I'm looking. I, I don't think, Bill, go ahead. Mike. Yes. See, I was wondering, um, I know that's an extensive report. It's an, uh, amazing how durable it is when it was done in 13 and 14. It's, this is an amazing. One of the things, the question is, do, do you have, uh, is there any tracking or any report on utilization? Um, you know, what, what general, you know, how many people use the parks and so forth? Um, if I can. Audra, yeah, I was gonna look to you or Neil, so you go first. The best way, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to track. One, one thing that's an interesting way we can track the playgrounds, some of the playgrounds we've put in, is we have been putting these Viva smart playgrounds in, and they actually have computer software built into them. So every month I get a report on the usage of the playground itself, which features are being used most, what's the peak time, what time of, even time of year. Like, so I have charts where I can see exactly how they're using the playground. So it's actually a really nice feature to have yeah. as far as going on the trails or we just doing our periodic surveys and online surveys for a project or when we put those out there, that's really the only way we're getting direct feedback from residents on what they're using. So we've done more surveys since, since the plan was put together, but that's, that's the main way sure. to track it. Yeah. I mean, I, as I have been traveling extensively on campaigning, um, when you circle a neighborhood and go around and everything, you end up hitting a park somewhere. It's yeah. absolutely incredible um, with, the, with the, the way the parks are ringed through the various communities. So I really, um, not just utilization, but just the enhancement of neighborhoods, um, the green space, the views and all that. Uh, I'm just really impressed with them. So that's all. Thank you. Others want to, questions or comments? Um, so we're, we're at the point of the agenda where we're at uh, reviewing park program summary. And I think most of you are uh, probably maybe more familiar with this part of it. And this is where we're going to get a kind of deep dive into some really some practical things. And so uh, Neil and Audra, um, we're going to transition the slides. Do you okay. have any kind of setup or things you want to share to kind of lead into this piece? I think, you know, the way we kind of put it together was uh, just talking about the kinds of programs that were offered. I know there was a question, I don't know, Bao, if it was you but the last meeting, but I wanted to know the variety of all the different kind of programs that we offer. So we broke it down into adult youth athletics and then into youth programs, camps and active adult, actively aging or active adult programs, um, and then community outreach and special events. And then we kind of are going to break it down into program budget examples and uh, just and maybe some marketing. So what I was going to do is just kind of do the overview of the programs and then I would turn it over to Neil and he can talk about some of the, the different breakdowns of budgeting if that works for everyone. All right, I'm going to then share my screen. You got some slides that are there, but uh, what I would ask folks to do is again kind of uh, jot down some notes or capture things that are uh, triggers in your head for questions or comments. Um, and like I said, if you're on the screen, you can kind of wave your hand or jump right in or use the chat box. I'll try to do my best to monitor. Um, and Bryce, you're, uh, you also do this work for the city of Little Canada. So when you uh, want to jump in and reinforce and say, yeah, that's how all cities do it, uh, feel free to kind of jump right in. We're, we're happy to have you. And Audra, I'm going to turn it over. To you, has everybody got that screen? Yep. All right. And I, will, and I will go slowly because I know you have not seen this yet, but you will get this information sent to you as well. So yeah, if you'd wanna to go to the, the next slide, Mike. Like I said, we broke it down into different categories and tried to put a lot of information and in, in, in a little bit of space. So I'll, I'll kind of may jump around a little bit, but the point of this would be just to let you know um, the kinds of programs that we do. And then by multi-agency, we mean, do they co-run it with us or is it, you know, do we have, are we read the directors and work with other directors from other cities? It doesn't mean that we didn't 
um, do it with other cities and people participating. It just meant the way it was, uh, it was administrated. So um, we'll start with our volleyball leagues. We ran those ourselves, but we had participants from, from all over the metro. We actually had quite a few teams from Wisconsin as well. They, they came, they liked our program, they drove over. And so they requested early games because they had a, <laughs> they had a 45 minute drive home. Uh, but we ran as many leagues as we had uh, our volleyball courts in space. So we, we always filled up our leagues. We had uh, co-rec, we had women's and men's. And so that was, those were our volleyball leagues. And again, we also put on there, can it be offered virtually? No. So that's what you'll see. So if it could be offered virtually, we listed it. Um, and if it was run with other cities and coordinated with other directors, we put um, that as well. So softball, yes. Neil, you want to speak briefly to softball? Sure. And then if I can, I'll just interject something to it. Yep. Um, the, uh, the virtual option. So the, um, there are programs that obviously, I mean, I think, there are options to offer them virtually. What we what I did put on here was just currently what we did try to offer virtually when when this happened, kind of mid March, um, and not and then not necessarily other programs that we moving forward that there could be like a virtual option for, um, just because with everything that happened and with, with shutting down the programming when when COVID hit, um, you know we there wasn't um, as much. Um, we're, there was still a lot up in the air. So that's why there's some of these that uh, say no could probably, um, could have virtual option. But they would have to be offered in different format than what we currently do. Correct. Yep. Um, so the softball leagues we did have, um, so we would run a uh, spring, um, or a, sorry, a summer and a uh, fall league. And then if, depending on how late the, you know, the, the summer and the fall leagues go, we sometimes may see in a, a late fall league. Um, we did those all in-house. Um, however, this year we did start working. We, we joined with um, uh, White Bear Lake and we kind of talked with North St. Paul too, offering um, joint leagues on the same day where teams would rotate between the cities to kind of help fill out our league. So it was something we looked at, an alternative way to um, continue to offer our leagues as you know, adult softball numbers have in most places have, have, been gone, have gone down pretty significantly over the last handful of years. Um, so we did look kind of in a, a different way uh, in that way to uh, offer some stuff. Okay. Yep. And then we had beanbag leagues, which was something fairly new. Neil, is it the sec? Do we have two years of beanbag leagues? Yep. This would have been the third year going to, in, into this this year. So that was Another really alternative well program. Yep. Uh, kickball league, Tai Chi, which was something that we didn't do on our facilities, but we coordinated it, and that took place um, at, at another studio um, ballroom dance I think some we have someone on the the uh, committee that can speak to how ballroom dance worked out and <laughs> it was a great program and we did offer we did try to offer that virtually um, before we decided to stop all rec programming so that was one we <clears throat> were looking to move forward um, for adult programming and then just switching over and again there's so many programs so if there's one you have a question about feel free to just ask us otherwise I'm just going to keep moving and uh, for youth athletics, the basketball league, I think Neil touched on it. We have several people on this task force that were involved in the youth basketball program, that it was very extensive and across many communities. But we also offered a senior high basketball league that op operates pretty much the same way. And that, how many participants were in that last year, Neil? Do you know off the top of your head? I mean, we had uh, seven, teams? Seven, 70 teams, and there was maybe like, I think it was eight different, um, seven different teams, communities. Yeah, eight, eight cities. <clears throat> um, same with our youth volleyball league. Um, it was multiple cities were involved. I know Little Canada participates in our youth volleyball league as well. Fall and spring soccer. Um, soccer is a big one. And there's, uh, again, people on the task force that know about how soccer was run. And intro to basketball, that was an in house program, but it was taught with instructors from Neil, where the last year, where were they from? It was the uh, the nurse the it was uh, Damian Williams from the nurse North High School basketball coach. Yeah, and the T ball program. So you can see through there lot lots of different youth athletic programs, and for the most part, a lot of them were collaborations with other cities. And then the other ones, again, even though we ran them, people from all over the area were drawn to participate in the program. So, um, if you want to move to the next slide, Mike? And then outside of just traditional sports for youth. We had 
preschool gymboree, which was um, over at the community center. And it really had all of our, like our gymnastic tumbling mats and our, our, you know, early childhood toys, everything geared toward preschool kids and giving you a chance to run around and play. And we would open up the gym on Thursdays when the weather got bad and couldn't get out to the park or you didn't want your kids getting all rain, you know, muddy and, and gross and it got cold and they could come into the gym and just pay a flat fee and um, participate in that. And that was a really well-received program. Um, we offered art classes. We had our tumbling and gymnastics classes, which filled pretty much every time we could offer them. The tough part was finding a instructor. It's a very specialized skill. So hanging on to your tumbling gymnastics instructor is a challenge. Bryce knows all about that too, huh? <laughs> They're gold. Other cities will call you and you're like, nope, I'm not going to share. <laughs> um, karate, Neil, do you want to touch on the karate program really briefly? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've been doing karate for um, probably 10 years now, almost there. Um, started at the community center and we partnered with um, the Edge Martial Arts um, out of Stillwater and they kind of had Maplewood as their second location, as kind of their satellite location. Um, and uh, that, that was offered at the, uh, the community center as well. Um, we did offer that virtually, um, and it had some pretty good, uh, pretty good response for um, for the participants there. So, and as I think a lot of people know, offering things virtually, there's there's groups of people that will refuse to do it just because it's not the same, and then there's some people that maybe would give it a shot. So it's kind of you know you might get new people, but you also it's a it's a different uh, different crowd. So those yeah. are all um, you know, test outs. Okay. The youth dance program that we have been partnering with Mayor Arts, they actually provide uh, dance instruction throughout the Metro. And um, again, we had our, our program and, and we would offer the classes and then every season ended with a recital at the community center on the stage, which parents really loved. We did offer that class remotely. Um, Mayor Arts just offered it to everyone in the Metro and they let anyone sign up and we just sent participants there. And I know they're currently still doing that. So that was one that pretty successfully transitioned. Again, like Neil said, it's not perfect. Some parents really want their child to have that in-person experience, but um, that was one that was pretty successful to offer online. Jam the Gym was a pickup program. We have the community gyms, Carver Community Gym. Um, we had a partnership with them. That one, we have, we have ended that partnership with Carver Community Gym. It was just kind of the right time to do that with cost and not having uh, casual part-time staff to run the gym. And then also, for those of you who know, Carver is going through a massive remodeling and you know they're just adding on and the, the whole school is changing. And so it was the right time to, to walk away from that particular partnership, but we still do have one at with District 623 at Edgerton Community Gym. And the Jam the Gym programs are basically, give parents a night out. You can come drop your kids off with our staff. We'd have games and activities. Parents could go out to eat, shop, whatever, and they could come back and pick up their kids. And same with the after school sports club. It was just a supplemental after school sports program for kids. Once the bell rang, they'd go to the community gym, be with our staff, and then parents could pick them up. So it's just another option for after school care. And then moving over to camps, you know, we did volleyball, Ninja Warrior camp. That was, and that was in Woodbury, correct? Neil, is that where they, they had the ninja courses that we don't have them? you know, the equipment to do that, but we would sign up kids and transport them there and take them to camp. Um, we had Lego summer camp. One that's not on here that we did was horse camp where we would take kids to Woodlock Stables and just outside of Hugo, and then they could participate in, in horse camp, which was really a nice thing for kids that normally didn't get a chance to do that. It was much cheaper than some of the other horse camps around the area. Um, and then... There was a skateboard camp too that was on yep. that, that they did, but I think they had their they, third layer. Yeah. Yep. And then um, for actively aging adults, we had, we just listed some here of this pastry and painting class was just a fun thing to do at the Wakefield community building. We had an instructor that offered the classes and instead of the wine and painting classes, these were during the day. So they got delicious pastries instead and they got to paint and have that socialization and camaraderie with other people. And then day trips were the big, um, programs that we did. We did how, so many trips and they would usually fill up and we would just go all over from down to Old Log Theater. We'd go on the, 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 the river cruises in the fall to see the leaves. They would go to plays and just all kinds of things. So that's what that was. Any questions? Okay, on to the next slide. Oh. 
Mike Erickson, it looked like you had a question or is that just no. me reading it? Okay. Nope. Other folks with questions? It's a, it's not, that was, certainly wasn't an exhaustive list, but uh, oh, we're going to get this more yep. detail here. Yep. And this is the community outreach and special events. And this is really condensed down. But a lot of what we've done the last couple of years based on what we heard the need was and to try to do community outreach and, and, and do that connectedness with the community um, were the special events. And these are things that usually don't make money, even if we charge the small fee, like the, East, the egg hunt that we did at Edgerton Community Gym doesn't cover the cost but it helped us keep track of signing people up so we didn't get mobbed and overwhelmed with the hunt that we did because we wanted to make sure everyone got a chance, there were enough eggs for everyone, we had the supplies that we needed. So we charged the token $5 fee for that. Um, and we usually had, you know, with the kids and their families, you know, over 500 people show up for that every year. Um, the Santa's workshop party, that's another thing, charge the fee so we know who's coming and how to prepare and, and, and plan. Um, holiday fun hours for arts and crafts programs based on the theme of, of the holiday, whether it was, you know, Halloween or um, Easter, Christmas, and we, we would offer those holiday classes. And then the big um, summer events were the Celebrate Summer events, and we do three of those a year, and Mike Erickson talked about how um, some of those events they would partner with us on, uh, but they, we would get, I would say every event had almost a thousand or more people that would come in and out of participating in the events and we would give away free hot dogs, water, chips. We'd have partners from all over the community come from Ramsey County to just having booths and giving away things and we'd have activities at those. This last year we weren't able to do them so we offered the virtual events that we talked about at the last meeting. Weren't the same but we did try to offer one a month so we did three of the virtual online events in, in place of them. There's a Mother's Day bowling event where just for that weekend, kids and, and the whole family can come out to Sunray Bowling and have pizza and they get a flower for mom and they can just have a good time. The rec run, Neil, I'm going to let you talk about that because that's, that's Neil's baby. So the, the rec run um, was a fundraiser we, we did for um, the last Saturday in September for the Youth Scholarship Fund. Um, anyone that, that registered and, and signed up all the all the proceeds would go to the youth scholarship fund to help uh, you know fund some additional uh, monies there for uh, any Maplewood residents needing a scholarship. Um, we'd get uh, bagels and coffee donated from brewers. We'd um, shirts. Um, the 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 guy that did the shirts that does all of our shirts gives us a big discount on the shirts for those. Um, Greg Arco has suburban sports wearing. We have some other. Um, uh, partners that donated and you know a couple would donate a, a gift card so we could be able to go out and we could buy some um, you know, breakfast bars uh, juice boxes sam's club would do the same um, so that event was a very you know very low cost event and and was a, a great way for, for us to build some more um, you know, funds in the scholarship fund we used the gateway trail it was a great run yeah. but again and just, to, yeah, just to add the scholarship fund for those of you who don't know what that is we have a it's funded with charitable gambling funds that we would apply for and also donations or like the rec run to raise money. And for every one who's a Maplewood resident, their child for every season, each child could, if they qualified, could get a scholarship where we would, the city would pay two thirds of the cost of the activity. And for something like youth basketball, that's a big, big uh, savings. We'd pay two thirds of the cost and then the family would pay one third. And we also set up payment plans so they could pay as they went because we had a lot of families that, you know, it, it was tough. So, you know, we, we set up the scholarship fund for that. So just kind of an overview of the, some of the program that we did. Any questions? I, uh, this is Mike. I think what I'll add is, uh, you know, that youth scholarship fund that they talk about is a really important part of the city council's uh, strategic plan to have a, a more inclusive community. So we don't want uh, income to be a barrier to participation. It's one of the key measures in the city council strategic plan. It's part of the work that we do around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion with our MORE team, of which uh, Audra is a, a leader on that team. And so uh, it really is consistent with kind of where we are, uh, where the council wants us to be as a staff in terms of how we deliver. And so I think that's an important piece. And then Mike Erickson raised a finger, so I will... <laughs> 
Excellent, excellent information, Audra, I think for all of us. My question for the group and, and for you is, compared to other cities, the partnerships with our other uh, sister cities in the area, that's fantastic. How do we rate in terms of our offerings to, and, and I'll just pick on Bryce and say, Bryce, are you offering all this stuff over there in Little Canada or just kind of, uh, you know, what's White Bear doing? Are they, do, are they comparable to us? Uh, yeah, here in Little, in Little Canada, we are not offering that many, you know, our residents, uh, we're under 10,000, four square miles. Uh, our staff is um, two plus seasonals. We don't have any community buildings, uh, so we can't offer a lot of the, uh, a lot of the things that Maplewood can. We do try to do as many community events and activities mm -hmm. that we can, movies in the yep. park, ice cream social, um, you know, things, we, we have the space and the capacity for those, um, which, you know, I'd echo um, Maplewood's comments are expensive, but, you know, they're great events, uh, especially for, you know, building neighborhoods and communities and in those relationships they are fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, here in Little Canada, we have the luxury of a nonprofit, the Little Canada Recreation Association that does subsidize all of our sports um, and our youth activities. So that's a big help. But um, going back to a, a lot of the things is uh, we, re we typically relied on Maplewood for, you know, um, soccer and floor hockey, basketball, and all those types of things. So, because we didn't have the capacity to Good. fill that. Good. And then, Audra, how do we rate or how do we compare to our, our sister cities? I mean, we, we offer a lot, right? We, we do. We actually... Yeah. We do, and, and I think we might, the plan might be to, to get into that a little bit more at the next meeting, but I will say comparatively to other cities that are um, even maybe a little larger in size, we did offer a lot, or, or, or staff-wise, the number of staff they have for what was offered, we did offer quite a lot of things, which we were happy to do. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. yeah, no, no, no. I... Yeah, we did. Yep, that's good. Good. Thanks, Mike. Yep, thank you. Audrey, do you want me to go to the next one? Yes, and then I'm going to turn this over to, to Neil, and he can kind of go over some of this budget information. All right, so uh, we had uh, at the last meeting, I, I think there was a couple of questions just on maybe looking at just pulling out some of the, the larger or bigger programs um, that we offered. Uh, and this is obviously just, we I, I pulled three of them, um, one youth league, one adult league, and then um, we pulled one like a non-sports uh, recreation program. So we did youth dance um, and all kind of have their differences. So it, it, it lends kind of a, a full, a more full picture of um, expenses and revenues and, and how the, the programs are um, budgeted and, and, and operated. Um, so starting with youth basketball, it's um, that first line is, uh, Maplewood participants that registered with Maplewood um, for our teams. Uh, that would, so we had around 11 teams this year um, at you know, $135 a piece for the kids. Um, and so there's the revenue for that. We, so I offer, you know, I coordinate the entire league for the other participants, for the other league participants. Um, and there's 12, I think we had 12 the last couple of years. Last year we had 10. Um, other communities involved and each team that gets put into the league um, is charged an administrative fee and there's two tiers of fee based on whether there's hosting uh, games or not. Um, so in total with the number of teams we have in the youth league for basketball, the admin fees um, were not, a little over $9,000 last year. Um, and just as a breakdown on how Maplewood pays a lot of those expenses up front um, with our with referees, um, you know, gym space, um, and and things like that for games. So that that gets paid up front um, by the hosting teams, the hosting communities, I should say. Um, and then I compile all those expenses at the end of the year, put them into a spreadsheet, and figure out for the entire league expenses, um, medals involved, um, fees for gym space for games. Um, supervisor fees, that kind of stuff, for gym supervisor fees, things like that, referees, scorekeepers, everything. Um, get the total league costs and then break it down 
divided by the number of teams that participated. So every team, pay, every team in the league pays their fair share of expenses, pays the same amount of expenses just for participating in, in the league. Um, and that usually is around, it gets to be around 550 to $600 per team um, around the entire league. Um, it's almost 800 games uh, or 700 games each season um, amongst probably 10 different locations. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty big um, widespread un undertaking for sure. Um, so that's the, that's where you see the Minnesota, the Maplewood team's share of league play expenses. What that means, so this is only specifically for Maplewood teams plus our admin fees of, um, for coordinating the league. But um, so that's $6,200 is for the 11 Maplewood teams. That's their expenses or their fair share of expenses. Um, and that's our practice expenses, the Jersey and the equipment expense. So that breakdown right there is specifically for um, the youth basketball and Maplewood teams um, alone um, with the admin fees for operating the league. Um, and jumping to adult softball, that's a little bit, uh, like now that's a little bit different as well because that's all in-house. There's no, we're not, this is for 2019 numbers. So we're not coordinating with any other communities. There's no other revenues or expenses other than the softball registrations. Um, and then, so there's the, the softball registrations are there. And then the sanctioning with USSA is $22 a team. Um, and then softballs are about 375 a piece and each team gets, so if there's, you know, 15, 15 games they get, or there's, you know, 14 games they get seven balls because the home team provides the ball. So that's all factored into there. And then the umpire fees, um, 2750 a game. And then I have staff at the building the first week to take rosters, give out uh, the, the game balls, score books, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the adult softball um, breakdown. Um, I can cover you, Sam, if you'd like. Sure, go ahead. Sure. Actually, you know, before we jump into that, just, I mean, that was a lot of, I mean, not everybody reads spreadsheets every day unless you're right. you know, <laughs> into this uh, spot. So I, I just want to say, um, Beth is from Little Canada and the Northeast United. We love and appreciate all the fun, reasonable price activities Maplewood and nearby cities offer. Thank you. That was part of the, the chat question. Um, we did have a couple of folks join us. Vicki Leher, welcome. And Greg, welcome. We see you join our screen. We're happy to have you. If we would, uh, just for fun, uh, unmute yourselves and say hi so we can make your test your audio. Vicki, we can go first and then Greg, please. Hi, everyone. Sounding good, thank you. And then Greg, how about you? Hello, everyone. Awesome, thank you. So while we are uh, going through kind of some program budget examples, um, kind of walking through how does youth basketball work? How does adult softball work? Uh, you know, how does the, what are the mechanics of revenues and expenses? And you know, one of the things that's not in here uh, is the, the staff time that it takes to kind of coordinate this. So this is just to have the event. It doesn't actually cover the cost of operating the building. It doesn't cover, you know, the heat and the electricity and those kinds of things. So those are costs that are uh, still account, they're not accounted for in a program necessarily, uh, but it's still a cost that's borne by the city. And so it, it's not a, a hundred percent, um, uh, it doesn't include Audra's time or Neil's time, but so that's an important distinction um, that I want to point out. But Audra, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of go sure. through another example. I'm going to share my screen back. And you're going to take youth dance, correct? Yes. And, okay. and this is just an example of a, a, a typical way we do um, some of these kinds of, of programs where we, we find instructor Mayor Arts is the, the company that we work with. And they tell us they're a contract with us, an agreement, and they tell us what they need to make per student for them to run it. And then we figure out our costs and, and, and what we can charge and try to balance that with making it affordable for Maplewood residents, all that goes into it. And then we determine a fee to charge ourselves, which you can see um, in the chart. So they charge us, so for specific classes, they will charge us like $54 a student or $48 for some of the smaller classes, or they'll charge $86 a student. And we have to figure out what we wanna charge on top of that. And that's reflected in the revenue that we have. So, um, so the expenditures, you know, would be, you know, the 10,597, but revenues are the 21, 
173 because it just kind of balances out what we charge on top of that. But we provide the space. We do the advertising, the marketing. We put it in the rec brochure, and that'll come up on a slide in a little bit. Um, but we take care of all of that, and that way we're, you know, we know what we need to, how many kids we need to have in a program to run it, um, and the instructor can decide. So if there are only four kids signed up for a class, Mayor Arts would decide if they wanted to run it, if they're willing to run it for that, then we'll run it because we're not gonna, we're not gonna lose out on running it that way versus if we're paying an instructor per hour, then that falls on us. Well, what if, are we gonna run it with four kids and what's the revenue gonna be for that? So that's just an example of one way we do these kinds of programs. And there's several different ways to do it, but this is pretty common. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, not seeing any. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. And I'm, I, think, I think I mentioned this at the last meeting that warming houses are another thing like the community outreach events. They don't make money, they're an expense, but they're an important amenity to the community. And so this just is the breakdown of 2019. You know, zero revenues, but we have to pay staff to man the warming houses. And, um, and this does not include the part maintenance cost of maintaining the ice, the staff that have to go out and get the rinks ready, maintain them, clear off the snow, but this is just what we would pay seasonal casual part-time staff to be there. Um, as far as our cost and um, just manning that and then it's minimal for supplies um, but as you can and see I, I will interject that the uh, ten dollars an hour for the uh, warming house staff rates um, it's yeah. becoming harder and harder to to, to um, um, find people to fill that rate so that's another expense right. that um, same as scorekeepers of basketball that, that sometimes um, that especially the last few years uh, it needs to get adjusted moving forward yeah. For, for community event staff, we, pay, we paid them $12 an hour if that kind of gauges it to get staff that are willing to commit to a summer worth of events and, and show up. Um, we paid them $12 an hour. Mm -hmm. so Questions that, or comments? Yeah. Bryce, you've got a hand raised. Uh, yeah, just to touch on that $10 an hour, we actually, <clears throat> in Little Canada, we raised to 12 um, because we're having such a hard time finding that's mm -hmm. those uh, people to staff those positions. And not only that, um, even at $10 an hour, you're getting you know, typically really inexperienced people that don't have any interest uh, in being there. And, and that wasn't the image that Little Canada wanted to, to uh, have our public see. So we, we even tried raising it to 12 and, and we're still having a hard time, you know, finding people at 12, but, um, you know, as it's been said, it's it's tough to even it's tough to find money to increase it more. So, mm -hmm. uh, sure. One way just, we we are a little bit lucky with that is when we have the community gym staff and the special event staff and the and the Wakefield community building staff. They would be looking for hours in different parts of the season, so we could use some of that built-in staff and say, "Hey, can you guys take some more May house shifts to get more hours?" So that was a benefit there. But it is hard to find people for sure, especially for nights and weekends in the winter. Right. Uh, Nolan, you've got a hand raised. Why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Uh, do you guys have any like rough ballpark estimate as far as like the the man hours it takes to run like the basketball or the adult softball league? And then, you know, what with those man hours, like, you know, what staff compensation is needed to cover that? You know, like any idea at all? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I don't Regular know. Regular season or tournament? Many, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Neil can probably say like how many hours a, a season he probably dedicates just to like basketball. Uh, you well, know. I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's hard to calculate that because it's um, Monday is all uh, Monday. It's literally almost all day Monday dealing with stuff um, from the weekend, and then um, kind of throughout the week, it's multiple. It's it's multiple hours a day um, throughout the week, but. Monday is, Monday's a pretty full day. Um, and then uh, Saturday is going out and, and checking on the games and stuff too. Um, adult softball, not as much. That That's not as um, staff intensive. Cause that's, you know, the, the adult sports seem to be, they, they generally go off with um, less issues with being able to uh, um, you know, set the schedule and then making sure that uh, you know, the umpires are there and then they go, you know, it usually works itself out. But uh, and a lot of it's admin of, like you said, if issues come up or there's issues between one city and another and coaches and all that, that, that kind of work, the communication, the emails, 
sometimes, luckily not all the time, Neil and I are exchanging emails from Friday through Monday morning, depending on what's going on. So it's just, it's just you need to have that person that's always there to kind of administer when you have that many people involved in a program. Okay. I know, I know it's a hard thing to kind of go back and figure out if you're not actively tracking something like that at the get go to to see i know thinking back on it it's it's tough to figure out exactly how many hours in a week you dedicated to that specific job or task of your job versus the other ones so right yeah but i do think you raise an interesting question about what is that time and if and if the if the desire is to shift to a different model it would be helpful to know what that model has to kind of expect it to deliver and so sure. um you know, maybe we can brainstorm or just maybe ballpark, you know, some high level things about this is administrative and this is paying bills. And this is, you know, I can't imagine finding umpires is ever a fun task and <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> You're yeah. calling around your roster of, of umpires. I look at my Garrison the, and laugh because he's one of them. That's the, that's the Friday night at nine 30 or texting, yeah. you know, the people and people aren't showing up or people got called sick or, you know, Talking to Matamida or White Bear Lake, like, hey, you got any extras? Or the con us asking if I got any extras. Yeah, it's uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Or being ready to jump up on the volleyball stand and, and officiate a game if you don't have an official. Yep, all the fun. Well, thanks, Andrew. Thank I appreciate that. Um, sure. This next one, we broke out um, the 4th of July kind of by itself because it's a unique, unique event for the city. It hasn't always been in the Parks and Recreation Department, but the 4th of July for a one-day event, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of planning, and obviously the biggest cost is um, the fees for service. It's for our uh, Maplewood uh, fireworks display, it's between sixteen dollars and $17,000 is what it costs to put on the, put on the fireworks at, at Hazelwood Park. Um, and then there's the other fees are kind of broken down for what it costs. So for 2019, the city spent $26,956 and 30, 31, was very precise, 31 cents um, to, to put on that event and took in some revenues, almost 8,000. Um, but it, it's a beloved event by the city. Everyone loves it, but it is, it is an expensive one day event. And this year it didn't happen obviously because of, of, of COVID concerns. And I'm not sure what's gonna happen next year, you know, what, how the city is gonna move forward. and this is usually the time of year we're signing the contracts for the fireworks again and kind of putting stuff in place for the portable stage and all that. So it's all, you know, currently on hold because things are so uncertain, but just wanted you to kind of see what goes in cost wise to uh, that event. Hey, Audra, if I could, just for the good of the order, um, sure. since uh, Maplewood does not have a city festival, this in essence is our city festival, albeit a one day city festival, but it Correct. grew from, well, what it was before, just fireworks, to what it is now. And it's a big deal. It's a big deal for Maplewood residents. Correct. Yeah, we don't have one, like, week-long, like, Rose Fest or something nope. like that. But we do the, the big Celebrate Summer events, Boo Bash, and this. We do single, like, one-off kind of events instead. Yep. All right. Um, then the last, oh, if you want to go to the next slide, if there's no questions. This is just to really briefly touch on, there were some questions about marketing programs and what we do. Um, that the Maplewood uh, rep brochure, there's a picture of the, the last issue we did before everything hit, that was through April of this year. Um, and it it's, has all of our program offerings, it's also offered online and we put it on the website, it's mm -hmm. on our social media, but that's the rep brochure. And we, we did that in house, we created that, we, um, use InDesign software and create that ourselves. And then we have a publishing company that puts it together and mails it out for us. And that was three hard copy books a year. We got away from the four. The, the fourth one was an online um, rec brochure. And every year we evaluate, people seem to still really want that hard copy, but we're leaning more toward just offering online brochures. And then we supplemented with a monthly newsletter in the months where there wasn't a rec brochure just to give updates on programs that got mailed out to everyone on our list. Uh, we use Peach Star, that's District 622. They don't let you bring flyers to the schools anymore, but they do have uh, a website for um, offering. So as a parent, if you sign up for, you wanna know what's happening, um, you can get the emails with all the program listings. So that's what that is. We 
did direct mailings to people if they had signed up in our software, we would send direct mailings out. We tried not doing that and participations would go down. You know, we we're trying to get away from the paper, but it just seemed when a flyer got mailed out to the home, it increased participation. And then did email bat blasts with a company called Constant Contact. We did our own through ActiveNet and Team Sideline, and then used our social media. Our Parks and Recreation Facebook page has a has a really good following, so we put a lot of our stuff on face, uh, Facebook, and then the city's Facebook page and Twitter page as well. So those are the main ways that we advertise programs. Any questions about that? So that is uh, kind of at a, at a, a pretty fast, pretty high level kind of um, insight into how the city plans for uh, parks, um, parks master plan, how it does for specific programming. It's kind of giving you a pretty high level of what some of those programs are and then kind of the mechanics of how they're funded and, and what they look like. And uh, I think, you know, Audra notes the, you know, certain events, I think the expectation is that it be a provided service to the community. I think that's, uh, so you think about 4th of July and fireworks are not free, uh, but it's something that brings people together and brings a sense of community. So it really does sort of touch on all of those things. Who has questions or reactions to some of the slides and just a sense for, um, you know, anything that's sort of stuck out in Audra or Neil's sort of presentation. Uh, and I'll just open it up to the group and uh, let folks weigh in wave or unmute and I'll try to catch you. Okay. Question. Oh, this go ahead. Style. Yeah. Did I, did Audra already go over the, um, the Minnesota Fair or did I miss that part in the presentation or that's not part of Maplewood? Oh, the Ramsey County Fair? Yeah. Yeah, nope, that actually is put on by Ramsey County. We participate in their parade um, and, and have done some other partnership things with them, but that is actually run by Ramsey County. Okay, and that does not cost us anything no or effective. I know that okay. city council and other people participate in the parade and things but no we we don't pay for that sure thank you good thank you uh looking around for anybody who wants to jump in on a question or a comment go ahead Dorothy I can see you thank you okay and why can't you see me <laughs> I quite just because you're uh, you the whole screen got moved and so I I missed you and then I'll call on Greg next. But does my I don't see my picture showing up. I still see you. It's, well, I've got you, so you're looking good. Uh, okay, we, we can all see you. <laughs> I have a question on community education. Um, I I get the catalogs from St. Paul and from Roseville, um, and it seems like there are a lot of programs there that we could partner with um, and offer to Maplewood people. And there's probably all kinds of financial and whatever's, but I know some people who teach in those programs and I know they're going to be doing them um, electronically this fall and winter. And when we're looking at expanding what we might be able to offer, is that something to look into? Sure, Audrey, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, and as far as community and uh, District 622 has their community ed as well for um, that would serve Maplewood, North St. Paul, Oakdale. Um, we have in the past, it's kind of, it's been interesting in the 21 years I've been with Maplewood, there have been, depending on the year, and kind of gone through cycles where we've met with the school district and talked about partnering and then we would get to the point we might partner on some things and it didn't ever quite gel. It's kind of unique. It's not like in Roseville where community and Roseville put out a brochure together. I know in some communities they're very tied. It's different in, in Maplewood, but you know, with everything and all the changes going on and what we're dealing with now, I think this, like you said, is a really good time to revisit that possibility of partnerships. I think maybe the timing will be right this time. But we have attempted that many, many times over the years. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you thank you uh greg go ahead yeah i was curious uh like a lot of the other cities so i'm from oakdale they have a separate athletic association that does some of this for them and they're generally volunteer groups didn't there used to be a maplewood athletic association and if so what happened to it uh there there was maa they did 
baseball and they they were around when I joined the city um, and they they kind of just I, I don't want to say why but they kind of dwindled their participation dwindled and there's various reasons I think that that happened but they got to the point um, a couple years ago where they just decided to disband and that and we had always kind of stayed out of their way helped with them helped with fields and always facilitated things but we never offered competing programs and when they finally decided to fold they reached out to us and that's when and Neil mm -hmm. can speak to what we we reached out and decided okay we can start offering you know baseball and doing some things so they just didn't make it and they you know for, for a lot of reasons I think but Neil do you have anything to add? Oh, no, I think that's we when they, when they did then then we offered the um, kind of reformatted our t-ball program Again, trying to, to be nimble and make adjustments for your formative or team up program to kind of fit with the age group of um, second, third, and then the fourth and fifth graders that we, we ended up going to working with Roseville on the youth baseball program. Um, and they took us into their league and you know, we kind of like how we did with basketball um, yeah. and uh, um, adjustments uh, that way. Um, but we did pick that up when, when, when that, but we do, there is no other associations right now in Maplewood other than uh, NEU for, uh, for soccer pretty much. And I think it's just another, I don't know if it's the uniqueness of how spread out Maplewood is or that there's so many bordering cities or what it is, but like I said, in the 20 some years I've been here, that 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 commitment to that, that volunteering and that kind of thing hasn't maybe been as strong as maybe some other communities or that built in, you know, getting involved with your association. Because even with volunteers, uh, our nature center volunteers are a whole nother situation. They've got a very solid base, but trying to get that volunteer base built up has always been a little bit of a struggle, and I'm not sure why, but it just doesn't seem to be as much of the identity, at least up to this point. But again, you can always hope it'll change, and it's maybe something that we can grow, and that's maybe a really good place for us to look. All right, uh, Mike Erickson, and then yep. Aaron, are you, looks like you got a question, or it's just you have your pen. Okay, so we'll go Mike and then Aaron. Yep. Yep, if I could, Greg, just to respond to you as, uh, as a, a dad who coached uh, with, with MAA for more than 15 years, and I was with them right to the bitter end. The whole reality is, is there's always something better in a neighboring community. And of course, it was always you guys, you know, if you were good, you're over there playing in Oakdale or White Bear or Montebita, what have you. And in the end, just for the, for the fun of it, you know, rec baseball, uh, it just less and less and less. And so I was, I was there right to the very end. And they just said, no, we, we can't get the numbers. We, the, people aren't playing baseball uh, like they used to. And if they want to play, they're going to they're gonna go to you guys. They're going to go to Roseville and uh, White Bear. And, you know, and, 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 and Audra's probably right. The geography of our city was that unique. But, you know, even at the end, you know, so what? So you go down and, you know, I'm up at the north end. So you go down, uh, down to the bottom and play at Afton. You know, so what? You just got to, you know, put, get more time in. But yeah, it was kind of sad. And uh, even for North St. Paul, um, I coached a, a slow pitch back in the day. And if you were good, well, you got to go to North St. Paul because their program's better. Well, uh, no, it's not. It all depends on who the parents are and who's coaching and et cetera. So at any rate, you still have a strong program, right? In Oakdale, Greg? Uh, we're doing okay, but we certainly do struggle with the volunteers, too. Yep. Sometimes it feels perpetually like we feel like OA is going to fall apart at some point for lack of volunteers. Sure. But somehow at the yeah. last minute, people finally step up. Yep. Uh, Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, just wondering how we compare to the numbers of the Y and the, the school district. Are we, are we the same size numbers-wise, or do they have a bigger market share how, how did those three or are there other players as well sure um traditionally in the past with community ed we we had a kind of an unspoken agreement not to step on each other's toes in certain areas so community ed wasn't offering they were providing facilities and that was a big part of our partnership with them but they weren't offering a youth basketball league or a volleyball league um and with the why there was some talk that when they did start taking over operations, you know, of the, the community center that eventually they would be offering some of their youth programming. Um, I know they had began some of it and we actually have, as part of that agreement, maybe you don't know this, but um, Sherwood Park and Robin Hood Park are actually written into our agreement where they are reserved for the wife they chose to do um, 
programming because Sherwood, you could do soccer and Robin had some other things. That hasn't been taken advantage of yet by them, but I'm sure in the future going forward that that might happen, you know, because there's just been some transitions and then here we are. But um, that's my answer, at least with the, the Maplewood Y and, and community ed, in my experience, that's kind of where we're at. So they offered some things like the arts and crafts programs and some of the more enrichment things um, that we don't. And we, some things are in com competition, but for the most part, we try to stay out of each other's way if we can. It's kind of traditionally the way it's been. Good, thank you. Um, other uh, questions or, or clarifications? Dorothy, go ahead. Um, I have a comment that I'm not sure where it all fits in. Um, Audra, I know that we have a minimal adopt a park program. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there's a way we can look to expand that since that's something that's still available in this COVID time that neighbors can go out to their neighborhood park and maybe adopting one of those parks for your neighborhood would be a way to increase usage of those parks and also a feeling that um, we're still offering something to the community. Sure, that's that's a great idea. We definitely could. Um, we, we still are offering the adaptive park program. It's still happening and there is the potential to adopt any of the parks in Maplewood or the preserves or open spaces. And we do have quite a few where groups are still maintaining. We have a, a Boy Scout troop that has adopted Wakefield and um, individual residents and some groups. And then we do the, the all parks cleanup once a year where people can come, but definitely the program is still there. So we can, you know, Neil, we can put that on Facebook and Twitter. We can pull out and kind of just get the word out that we are always looking for help for sure. Mm -hmm. Any other okay. final? Go ahead. One more, Dorothy. This goes back to um, the last meeting on some of the budget things. Um, the CARES money that came from the federal government in regards to COVID, my understanding from what we were told is that it went into kind of a rainy day or a slush fund. Um, it's also my understanding that those funds have to be used by November 15th or we lose them. Is there some plan or um, outline of how those are going to be used and can they be directed to park and rec um, marketing or something at this point so that those monies don't just get lost? Sure. Uh, I'll take that one. So the city get uh, received um, Right, right, roughly seventy-two dollars per resident is kind of the the math about how it works, and so we just got a right around um, three point. I think it might have been seventy-four dollars. So we got a right around three point two million dollars. That money is to be spent by. Uh, it has to be dedicated by November fifteenth, and then it has to be expended by December fifteenth of this year. Um, the money that we got from the from the federal government, from the from the CARES Act, Corona, Coronavirus Relief Act, uh, paid for things that we use for uh, personal protective equipment for first responders. It went to pay for uh, staff time for people who did um, uh, COVID-19 response work. So uh, fire, EMS personnel, police personnel, uh, portions of my time that were redirected from, um, you know, when you work in HR, you don't actually think about having to create a, a preparedness plan and, a, and helping to shape the pandemic plan. So portions of uh, the leadership team staff time went into that. And they also had to make some physical changes to City Hall. So we operate a, a fairly uh, busy DMV. We do about 25,000 uh, transactions per year. Well, we had to install plexiglass barriers at all of our DMV counters. And so there were some physical investments that we had to make. There were some uh, payments to for staff whose time was redirected. And then there was the personal protective equipment, um, hand sanitizing stations and other kinds of equipment. And you lump all of that together and that wound up being uh, a little north of $2 million. And in fairness, we could have probably spent more. Uh, the city council also um, decided to take a portion of that money to help 
fund some of the services that the YMCA does. So the YMCA provided uh, food assistance, they provided childcare assistance to first responders. And so there was an agreement that was actually just executed uh, last week, the YMCA actually picked up the check for $800,000 to pay for services of direct service to the community. Uh, one, it was something that the Y stepped forward and did, and it was a need that in the community. Uh, and two, it really helped cement the partnership between the city and the YMCA. Uh, you know, when, when you're a business that relies on um, people to pay monthly checks to come use your workout equipment and people stop coming, you know, the YMCA as a system was probably going to lose about $30 million, uh, maybe more, um, th throughout their entire uh, upper Midwest operations. And so they were, I mean, they continue to face pretty significant challenges going forward. You know, and then the last piece of the CARES Act money that um, was there actually goes to the local hospital to help pay back some of the costs you know, I might get the number wrong, but Bill, I think the number is around $75,000 of money went to the hospital to pay for some of the expenses they incurred. And so by the time you get all of this CARES Act money, what happens is, is it pays for the things I described. And in the city, anything that is a surplus or leftover or unspent from the general fund gets carried over into next year's uh, reserve bank. And so, um, I would never call it a slush fund because it's not a slush fund because we actually anticipate spending those dollars in 2021 on things that we anticipate that we're going to have to do, not the least of which is we're anticipating some um, significant dip in the local economy as stores have been closed, as businesses shut down. We're anticipating uh, not only sort of business troubles, but also people not paying their property taxes. And as a city, when 75% of your money comes from the property tax payer and the local strip mall is not going to pay it this year because they don't have any income, uh, we anticipate needs uh, in advance. And so some of the money that's been sort of um, dedicated in savings uh, is we anticipate having to need it for those kinds of things. And so um, I'm going to look to Bill Knutson to see if I got the number right on the hospital, and then I'll look to Dorothy to see if I answered your question. Yes, Bill, you, you did. Okay, good. And Bill, you uh, there? There you go. You got your mute button. I'm trying to hit the right button. Um, the actual number uh, to St. John's was eighty-six million or eighty-six thousand. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. When you read the headlines about uh, Fairview, you know that. Uh, it's more than that. They lost what 250 million on this situation. So um, we had a a nice <clears throat> letter from Laura Kaitan, the local administrator, and uh, I think it helped them a lot. And you, your your report was right on, Mike, relative to the relationship with the uh, um, Maplewood Community Center and the Y. Um, that's very important. Yeah. Thank it's you for that, Mike. Yeah, it's 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 complicated and it's hard, and you 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 sort of get forced to make these choices under a tight timeline, and you you um, you want to be inclusive of all voices before a decision gets made, but sometimes you have to make the the, the decision with the best information you have. Um, you know, I think the city council realized early on that no one wants to cut park and rec programming, nobody wants to close the nature center, but if you sort of are forced to confront the reality that you don't necessarily know when you're going to have another customer, a paying customer to come into these services. It's really challenging. Um, and that's why convening a group like this to say, all right, let's remake this. Let's rethink this of how it can work uh, is kind of the work we're doing now. Mm -hmm. So Aaron, is that a pen or is that something else? I saw a pen in the screen. You're making notes. Uh, Mike Erickson, you made a motion to the screen. Is it, were you going to say something? I, Trying to make sure I catch folks. You're good. He's making notes as well. So I uh, appreciate that. Um, Audrey, you want to provide a little, any comments or? Um, I'll just, I'll just reflect what, what Mike said that, you know, it, it's complicated and it's just, there's no easy answer. If it was easy, we would have figured it out by now. So just 
and, and the, the, the biggest struggle is just trying to, re, you know, not look at how things always were, just to kind of be open-minded and think, okay, how can we move forward? What could we could do? Like when you mentioned, Greg, about OA, you know, struggling for volunteers as well. You know, I think every group that provides programs and recreational services has got to be struggling right now. So if we can find a way to maybe work together or find that that magic formula to, to, to still be able to offer services and events and things that, you know, our community wants and needs, you know, that's a goal and it's a big goal and it's not going to be easy, but I think it's an important one and it's worth looking at. Um, so Audra did send me something that I'm going to try to pull up on the screen, and it was a uh, it was an article from the from the National Rec and Park Association. Um, they do a it's essentially what you would think it is. It's all the parks and rec folks from around the country belong to a national association. And I'm going to share my screen really quickly just to share this uh, slide. I'll get the chat box out of the way, um, but you can see that you know that there is a, sort of a, a known people need to get outside and they want to be more active because they've been, you know, obviously uh, forced to, to quarantine in some cases, but two thirds of adults want their local government to dedicate funds and through taxes and levies to support their park program. Uh, and parents are uh, particularly strong supporters of that. And so you can see this sort of push and pull about people wanting access to good parks and good services but they also know that they're going to be uh, forced to uh, also cut services. And so, um, you know, I like that sound, by the way. Um, oh, isn't it nice? Like you're turning the page. <laughs> but again, most are anticipating that they're going to have redu reductions in service or in reductions in funding. And so this is going to be a sort of, this isn't just a Maplewood challenge. This is really a challenge for, for all rec programming uh, kind of going forward. And so we really see this, you know, um, and Bryce, you can probably nod along because I think you probably experience it in a more uh, direct way. Do you, do you want to add what's happening with other groups in your profession? Uh, yeah, so, you know, again, the same thing in Little Canada. The, uh, and I will say too, and I know I've seen Neil and I'm sure Audra's been on it, but, you know, um, we have been sitting in on uh, MRPA phone calls throughout all this. So it's not just... <laughs> not just exactly what we're doing here in the Metro, but you know, how is greater Minnesota tackling these and can, and can we use some ideas from what they're doing to incorporate down here and, and vice versa. So it's, it's a national issue. It's, it's a state issue. And of course it's a local issue, but I know, um, you know, at least here in little Canada, I, I, we've sat through a lot of these phone calls, zoom meetings on how, how we can tackle some of these things, how we can think outside the box, um, how we can, you know, I hate to say it, but create a new normal. Um, so it's just, you know, the whole time I just keep, like you say, nodding along because Little Canada is going through, you know, all, all of these issues as well. I, I have a question, Mike, to, to, uh, to Bryce's point and, and, and certainly Neil and Audra's. So how is it that, that, um, uh, the, the Minnesota State High School League is allowing uh, some sports to return in, in some way, shape, or form. You know, we're not allowed to do that, but they are. And I'm talking specifically about, uh, about volleyball reopening and, uh, you know, being on their website and seeing how they're doing it. How are they able to do it? And, and we can't. Um, so... Um, so I'll tackle that one. I think that the first, um, the first answer is, is we do not have the money in our operating budget today to deliver those programs. Okay. Okay. We've laid off uh, some key staff within Parks and Rec. Um, you know, the, we're done, Audra and Neil are the crew at this point. Um, and so there is not um, staff to, to sort of deliver those programs. You know, the other thing is we made a decision really early on that um, we, you know, as, as a senior management team, we made a, a decision in consultation, you know, with each other and made a recommendation to the city council that said um, faster reductions in service are going to make it easier to sort of be successful and launch forward. And so if we had waited until 
now to make hard choices, we think the choices would have been harder. And so we uh, advocated strongly for moving faster to make reductions in the nature center programming and in rec programming, uh, just because there was so much uncertainty. And, um, you know, that, that's, that decision's definitely open to critique and criticism, but it was the choice that we felt was responsible to advocate for uh, and, you know, put forward. You know, just to give you some context, the city uh, overall made reductions of over a million, of roughly a million dollars before it touched nature center and rec programming. So, uh, you know, reductions in staffing and, and not hiring um, CSOs and reducing all kinds of services and stopping capital investments. And so really trying to take the broadest view of the challenges we faced. And so um, this was unfortunately one casualty. Thank you. Uh, Vicki, go ahead. So um, does that mean that whatever our group comes up with, our recommendation is considering only that the staffing would stay? Just Audra and Neil? Uh, not necessarily. Um, the, the task that the council kind of laid out is, how do you create recreation programming that is, doesn't rely on property taxes and is financially sustainable? So uh, the number might not be 670,000, but it might be some smaller number, as long as it can, we are confident it can deliver good services and good programs and a high rate of return. That's, it's not, I'm, I'm not going to say that the answer is zero. Now, that being said, I, I, I can, I can say that the city council needs to be comfortable that it's a sustainable number that can deliver what the residents want. Um, so I, I'm not going to say that the answer is going to be zero, but I can't say it's going to be a full rate, full freight either. We don't actually know. Um, Council Member Knudsen, do you want to weigh in on that question about um, the uncertainty around the budget? Uh, I mean, it is completely uncertain. So, I mean, the idea of the task force is to, well, let's assume that, um, you know, the impact of COVID is something we're going to get used to. And when we talk about new normal and reset and all that, I think we just need to be prepared. Um, you know, lucky for us, good for us, if we conquer this thing and figure it out. But I think we'd be better to be planful than not. And when I was thinking um, what Mike was asking, Michael was asking was, um, you know, how does the, the high school league uh, do volleyball? I mean, how do they actually, you know, work it through with COVID? Uh, I wonder that too. You know, so and if anybody has the answer, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think it was money that got to them. I think the idea was they just wanted to to get the kids involved in in uh, in sports. So I don't know how they're getting by COVID uh, with volleyball, but they must be figuring it out. Yeah. Actually, um, I may have a little insight because my wife actually coaches volleyball for South St. Paul this year. She took over due to some budget constraints and not being able to hire a, a full-time coach right away. Um, mostly they, they're they aligning it with kind of how a lot of other sports, there's no fans. Um, there's okay. limits on how many, how many kids can be together in a group. So you have separate pods of, of your players. Um, uh, I think there was talk of masks had to be worn even while playing. I'm not sure if oh. that stayed as being required, but uh, essentially like if you're not in the, on the court, you're, you know, you have a mask on, you're spaced out even off the court and stuff, you know, so there's a lot of different regulations. Plus they're sanitizing all the equipment, every, every use, things like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's a huge in Denver to play and mostly too with just the turnaround, you know, it was a, we're going to play in the spring and then within a week it was wait never mind we're going to start you know last week so you know there, there was a lot of stuff to probably still to work out on that. Mm -hmm. thank you yeah other comments so i, I want to be mindful of time it's uh, 6 42 and so we'll we'll we've got about 15 18 minutes left um one of the things that I think Audra and I spoke about today is, um, you know, kind of how do we frame up what this task force is going to tackle? And I guess maybe the question I'll ask the group is, who are the, um, 
what are the, again, I, I mentioned this last time, what are the categories that we have to kind of wrestle with and who do we need to make sure is a partner at the table or what other piece of uh, information or research do you think would be helpful to know and to maybe have as a, a piece of background before we kind of dive into what our future might look like? Uh, and I'll open it up. Mike Erickson's got a finger yep. raised. I'm thinking that means he's got a comment. Yep. I, I think uh, to that point, it's really the relationship and partnership with the associations. The associations are the ones that are going to be able to, to reopen the, for example, if for those of you who know anything about hockey, well, kids are playing hockey again. Did you know that? And they're going through their associations. And so to that extent, um, the partnerships, they've got much more flexibility and obviously they've got, they've got the money, particularly for hockey because it's so expensive, mm -hmm. but you know, we, we need to have all of you associations in one way, shape, or form, because you have the flexibility, hopefully volunteers, and hopefully the, uh, the, uh, the funds to be, to be able to make things happen, because you can. And the other thing is, is um, there are some, and I mentioned this at our last meeting, there were, there were some softball programs that reopened in some way, shape, or form, and they were playing tournaments. They, they figured it out, and uh, not everybody, but... Uh, uh, they figured it out. In fact, there were some state tournaments here within the last two weekends uh, that some 10s and 12s are playing in. They figured it out. Okay. And then what other sports? Soccer. Some, some, I saw some, some soccer programs uh, in the various parks around in the metro area. They figured it out. So I, I think having all of you together with us um, is, is very, very important in, 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 in seeing what's going on out there. And I think to, to the earlier comment, whoever had it about what's happening out in greater Minnesota. Well, things are happening out in greater Minnesota. They're still playing softball at the village Inn and white bear Lake. So again, that's just an adult beer league, but you know, they just kept on a going. So mm -hmm. anyway, so there. Can I, can I ask the group a question or maybe it may, maybe it's Mike or maybe it's some of the other folks from the associations. Do you have a, is there a sort of a, a uniform wish list of things that an association <laughs> needs to be successful is it just the grounds? Is it grounds and the ability to pay for administrative things? Is it, do you just need um, an admin support to help you, you know, build out a calendar and send out, you know, manager emails and those kinds of things? What are the things association need that associations need to be successful? Greg, you unmuted first. I'm going to call in you. I mean, you might not even be ready, but you were there. Yeah, I was trying to think when we have enough teams, like at the younger levels, then it is just a volunteer director who sort of handles it all. Um, you mentioned wish lists. We do send wish lists uh, like Dick Sporting Goods as far as, hey, it'd be really nice if we had some more footballs or soccer balls, stuff like that. But when we, at the older levels, then you we typically don't have enough kids to do our own thing. We, you know, we might only have two or three teams. So then we join the community mm -hmm. and then some community administers it. I don't know that Oakdale's ever been that community, but like for basketball, we've been working with Neil and that's gone very well. Um, my understanding is we are going forward with basketball this year and it will probably be run by the Minnesota Youth Athletic Services. So, but we, yeah, we definitely need grounds for the field sports. We definitely talk to the school district about getting gym time for volleyball and basketball and stuff like that. And at some level you need help finding adults and kids and you need finding bodies to do the, to participate. Right. Okay. Who, and then who else would add what you need? Uh, Nolan, you just, uh, unmuted i'm going to say that you're next yeah i think i you know agree with greg i think in our situation um the the logistics of of having locations to play getting the refs scorekeepers that kind of stuff is what the is what the wish list for ours is i mean we years before joining the maplewood league you know it was it was essentially just playing either your other teams or possibly Invergrove Heights. And it was a rotation of you play, you know, the, the 
maroon team this week and next week you play Vergrove and then next week you're playing maroon so the the Maplewood League gave a broader view and it gave more experience you know visiting other cities it helped prepare you know for kids maybe that are going to go into traveling because you know it gave that feeling of traveling because you're going to Matamidi you're going to Cottage Grove you're going to different places in, in, in Maplewood uh, and then you know it took a lot of that we didn't have to find referees every Saturday you know we didn't have to secure places to play you know we kind of can focus on securing our look at you know gym space to do the practices and that kind of stuff so that was that's basically our wish list of of what it would be okay. I appreciate that that's that's helpful um so Mike mentioned relationship with associations finding programs and services that can maybe make money, whether it's softball or soccer, find those things that can maybe be interim um, cash generators. What are the other uh, pieces of information that you think will be helpful? Uh, thank you, Beth. You mentioned participants, fields, gyms, lower costs. That's what your uh, group association looks for. Um, what other things out there? or other information that you think is helpful or needed for us to, to kind of gather and, and share with the group. And staff, you get to participate in this question as well because you're in it. You know it as well as anybody. Um, I, I open it up to the whole group. Well, I think when, one thing that people mentioned was getting that core group of volunteers. And uh, again, when you have to volunteer sometimes, even though we love them, sometimes just be careful what you wish for because it, it presents a whole nother set of unique challenges, but not having to pay every referee or every scorekeeper at, at the rec level. I mean, with recreation leagues, I like to say they're, you know, it, it is a lead into traveling if it's a, we offer them so kids can get an experience, try a sport out, see if they love it, you know, and then if, and then they would move on to another level. But at this, at the recreation level, I think getting a core group of volunteers would be really nice to help offset some of those costs of, of, of running programs for scorekeeping, officiating for volleyball, soccer, uh, basketball. That would just be one thing I would throw out there. But again, easier said than done. Sure. Uh, Beth, I can see you on the screen, so I'm thinking that maybe you want to say something. I appreciate it if you can unmute safely. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, trying to get the volunteers, maybe um, ask like the teenagers of the community. I know when I went through school, I had to do volunteer hours to be in the Honor Society or um, my church. I had to fulfill um, hours for volunteerism. So, you know, maybe call upon them it's a fun time, you know, get them involved with young kids so then they can um, build relationships and the young kids can see old kids having fun and, you know, the old kids feel like mentors, so. Yeah, thank you. That's, um, interestingly enough, somebody in the Nature Center Task Force mentioned Century College has service learning requirements for some of their staff or some of their students and so there might be a way to build some partnerships relationships there um anything else that we i mean obviously i know that the ymca is a is a key partner and and it, it would it's you know and we're we're going to bring them in eventually they're still trying to solve their their staffing challenges uh you know we we they've had some staff reductions at their uh location and you know now they're there are some of their staff are doing working at two and three different locations. And so it's harder to ask them to kind of pull in. So uh, we will bring the y, uh, YMCA and the community center folks back into this conversation when they settle in a little bit. Um, so we haven't forgotten about them as a, as a partner. Um, Audra or Neil, any other kind of final comments about maybe partners or other information you think is going to be important? No, I think, uh, I think overall, I think everyone's kind of touched on some of the major ones, associations and community ed and, and, and the why. It's, it's just, you know, Maplewood doesn't have that association established either. So that's, that's the tough thing, I think, for, mm -hmm. for uh, with that aspect. 
All right. Well, it's uh, go ahead, Vicki. Yeah, some things that I've been thinking about in terms of maybe marketing, I guess. Um, I think a lot of families out there have established pods of people that they're seeing mm. um, and people that they're sort of, you know, a circle that they've established for themselves. And I wonder if when we're thinking about programming, how can we sort of target these groups and maybe provide activities or kits or something for these groups um, because they are established and it's a group of kids already together. And is there a way that we can sort of take advantage of that sort of new idea, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, neighborhoods that I've already established. Like we have a friend who lives in the town and country community, which is off of Highway 61, a mobile home community. And, and all those kids are always together as well. Or if we think about like apartment complexes and we're thinking about more of you know, the recreational activities or programs that we have could be sort of think about those groups. Um, and then another um, place that we've um, been going to a lot is the library. They're not open, but we are going there to pick up books and such. And so I think that's also uh, a good partner to consider. Yeah. And Vicki, the, oh, sorry, Mike, go. No, sorry. go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, to build on that thought, again, there, there are many way, different ways to look at this, but I think I don't want to speak for the whole group, but the underlying goal, at least for me, is to still provide programming for the community in whatever way that may look. And I love the ideas you just mentioned, but they probably wouldn't necessarily generate any revenue. But putting together something like that might make us eligible to, to apply for certain kind of grants or getting that kind of sponsorship or, or buying from community entities that we wouldn't normally get as being a city run program that charges a fee. And so if we did go down that route, that might open us up to some more funding and it would still be providing services for the people who need them the most. So that's actually a really interesting and great idea, I think. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Okay, and, and, and for you, Vicki, thanks for suggesting that. That program's already available in uh, the two sister cities. My hometown is Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center. It's called Rec on the Go. And they've, they've, they've figured it out. And, and I don't know what exactly that is, but Audra and Neil's counterparts that's what they're doing. They're bringing it to them. And those mm -hmm. pods that you described, and again, I'm, I'm bicycling, I'm walking, I'm biking. I'm, I see the pods out there. They're just, there's a group, pick the number. It's 10, it's 15. They're playing, they're playing uh, uh, volleyball. They're doing whatever. But yeah, why couldn't we bring something to them like mm -hmm. BP and BC are doing up there in, uh, in uh, Northwest uh, Minneapolis? Yeah, in my personal pod, we have a group of 10 kids and we started just playing basketball every Tuesday. So yep. it's sort of parent run right now, which is kind of awful, but <laughs> it is what yeah. it is. <laughs> what park do you guys go to then? Uh, we actually are playing in our, one of our neighbor's driveways. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yep. Well, and this is, I mean, this is a, almost a perfect segue, but this is how uh, athletic associations start. Uh, you know, it's, it's 10 kids in the neighbor's driveway and then you're, you're going to recruit a couple of more. And then somebody says, you know, we should do this all the time. And then it kind of grows. And I'm sure that's how Northeast United sort of started. It was in somebody's backyard who had a passion for uh, mm -hmm. soccer and athletics. And, and so um, don't discount your power in the pod and uh, mm -hmm. the role that you can play. I think this is a something. I think the other thing I'll say is that there's a lot of uh, energy around this, around figuring this out. And so I, there, we can't discount the passion as a, as a wonderful tool, as a kind of a little bit of juice to get this going. Um, but Mike Erickson said something, and I could have paid him money to do it, but he, saw, he talked about Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center doing something else. And part of our next conversation is going to be to sort of um, identify what other communities are doing and what their model is for mm -hmm. delivering service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Roseville's got one model and they have 18 recreation staff, um, not even including the maintenance folks, but just park and rec staff. They've got a staff of 18. Uh, Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center have a similar demographic makeup to Maplewood. Uh, mm -hmm. What are they doing that's a little bit different? What does a community like um, Savage and Shakopee do? They've got, you know, they're, you know, they're a long ways away from here, but they kind of have the look and feel of what Maplewood does. And they've got um, you know, it's nearby cities that have great amenities. And then they have cities like Jordan have got a ton of kids and no amenities. And so they've got 
uh, who, these kinds of mixes. And so we're going to pull together a summary of kind of what we think are some maybe peer cities or peer communities. Uh, not everybody can replicate what Edina does. Not everybody can do what nobody's got. You know, we don't have 90,000 residents like Bloomington has. But what are the things that we're out there? And so my last question for the group is, which cities do you see out there as somebody that we ought to look at, that they do good work, that we can steal their good ideas, and that you would think that we should include as kind of their service model? Who's out there that you like and you want us to kind of take a look at and share with the group next time? And you can just yell it out for all I care. Um, is there somebody out there that you go, yeah, I, I want to do it Woodbury's way, or I want to do it Hudson, Wisconsin's way? You know, think of the, um, don't go, don't go greater Minnesota, but try to think Metro. Coon Rapids. Coon Rapids. And Mike, if I could ask, maybe if we, even if after the meeting, it'd be great now, but even if you think of something, you can always, you know, email and, and let us know if you, if you see something, you think, hey, I want to mm -hmm. dive into this a little deeper. Just because we're at, you know, almost the end of the meeting, but if you think of something else, you can always get that information. To us. Well, Mike, only because I used to work for them many, many years ago, but you already said it. So Woodbury, you got to see what Woodbury's doing. Guess what? Yeah. If anybody can, if anybody can, and again, a little different, uh, a lot more affluent, but uh, uh, well-run city, uh, good staff. Um, yeah. Well, I can't think of a city that's like you, but I do think one of your challenges is you don't have a high school. So are there any close cities that don't have a high school? That's something to look at. There, we can probably find a couple that yeah. have odd shaped boundaries. Brooklyn, Brooklyn Park has three high schools and they don't claim any of them, so. I know. <laughs> we never, we never, when, when the voting went down, we never got Brooklyn Park High School. We went right. to Park Center, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you don't have to, I know I sort of put you on the spot, but if, if folks have ideas, Bryce, you, you have to say Little Canada, don't you? Just. <laughs> Little Canada, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just so small, but. Um, compared to Maplewood, but, uh, it, you know, I'm trying to rack my brain, but uh, if I, if I think of something, I'll definitely shoot out an email. Yeah, Throw out, uh, uh, Plymouth. I know the city manager there very well. See what the heck Plymouth is, Plymouth is up to. Again, they're very affluent like Woodbury, but if, if somebody's figured something out, they're going to figure it out. Okay. Well, I'm curious, did you invite anyone from Oakdale Parks and Rec? Um, we did not invite other, um, we did not for them. Um, but I know, we know the staff there, but so we can reach out and, and see how that works. All right, well, I appreciate that. Like I said, uh, I, and Audra dropped off somehow. So we, we lost her, but we'll get her back eventually. But um, you know, we will we will try to assemble what we think of as sort of different service models. So maybe some that are driven all by city staff, some that are partnerships with associations, some that are partners with Y with the with a local Y or a, you know a like Plymouth has a lifetime fitness agreement with their city, and so they have that's who operates their uh, one of their community center buildings. And so there's a lot of different ways to deliver the same service. And what we're going to try to do is give you a little flavor of each. And then what we think will happen is that it'll start to emerge as, you know, this might be, uh, we might take a piece of this one, a piece of this one, and we kind of make something that works for us. And so uh, it is 701. I, uh, I'm, I'm late. I failed in my duties to get you out on time. Uh, I will send out summary notes from this meeting. We will provide uh, the kind of the presentation materials that we shared. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of you for your participation. Uh, we will see you all in two weeks. Uh, so keep thinking, keep talking to your friends, keep talking to your neighbors, uh, keep brainstorming. Um, we will, um, we're on a good path and I appreciate everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. See you all.